Thanks, Brad. Cool. Hi, Web Visions. How's it going? <laughs> So as Brad mentioned, I was kind of concerned that everyone's going to be uh, a little food comey after lunch. And so I want to start out this presentation with talking about collaboration for Lean UX and Roller Derby with a really funny and awesome video. So what is it like to actually play Roller Derby? And how does it have anything to do with designing on a Lean UX team? So as Brad mentioned, I'm um, a designer at PayPal. Um, and for the past couple of years, I've been working on our consumer division um, for our digital wallet and just recently transferred over to our checkout team and still working on digital wallet. So what is roller derby? So roller derby is a highly collaborative sport, but it also goes beyond that. So um, the team that I coach is actually in blue and it might not look like it, but actually this is a lot of practice that goes into this. The girls that are playing on this team practice three to four times a week, several hours every time. And it's actually something that we put a lot of time and effort talking about strategy, perfection of skill, or at least as close as we can get to it, and then also team camaraderie with this as well. A lot of you guys might be familiar with the old school roller derby that happened in the 50s and 60s, the more theatrical side of roller derby, um, where it was bank track, it had men and women competing against each other, and way more theatrical in regards to fights, throwing gear, um, going over the top more, um, as I said, theatrical-based than athletic-based. However, in the resurgence of roller derby that happened in about 2003, um, it actually became a sport that became more legitimate within athleticism. And this is a photo from our playoffs for Western Division last year in Sacramento that uh, my team, Santa Cruz Derby Girls, played at. Um, and we're also part of a professional and actually international semi-professional international organization called the Women's Flat Track Derby Association. And it was started in 2004. And by 2006, we had 30 member leagues um, in the United States. And now, currently, we have 308 member leagues, um, 10 apprentice leagues, and we're also competing in 18 different countries. And this is huge for us. The growth has just exploded in the past over 10 years. Um, and so just a level set for you folks that have never seen roller derby or not sure exactly what it is. So it's two teams that are competing against each other in 60 minute increments. And within those 60 minutes, each team is fielding up to um, four players that play a blocking position. So as you can kind of see here, um, and at this time, um, within these two minutes, what happens is they skate around and um, there's also two people that start behind them. So during those two minutes, the people that start behind them are called the jammers, or the point scorers in this. And the main objective for that two minutes is to lap the pack as much as possible. Um, the first time they lap the pack, they don't score any points. But the second time that they um, lap the pack, they start scoring points on each um, opponent that they, that they uh, pass legally. And so one of the unique things about roller derby is you're doing offense and defense at the same time, which makes it a particularly challenging full contact sport. And so in 2006, I actually started playing roller derby, and this was in a Vegas game, and it was really, really fun, um, and I really enjoyed it. However, for me, um, the collaboration of leading a team and being able to see where we could go at, together as a group instead of individually contributing was way more interesting. So in 2008, I actually stopped competing in roller derby and started coaching. Um, and so I, actually, let me go back to that one. So during that time from 2008, um, up until recently, um, I coached the Silicon Valley Roller Girls, which is based out of San Jose, California. In 2013, I moved to Santa Cruz, California and transferred over to the Santa Cruz Derby Girls. And um, I currently coach the A team, which is called the Boardwalk Bombshells, um, which are featured in this photo um, and are also be featured throughout the rest of this presentation. Um, and one of the things that I love most about this team is it's a lot of different people coming and collaborating together to, co to go towards one common goal. And so we might still be asking yourself, how does this have anything to do with Lean UX? And so I've shown you my roller derby team. And so this is my Lean UX team. So this is the team um, that I worked with for a majority of my time with PayPal, the consumer web division. And so um, we also do apps within this as well. And so within this team that's represented here, we have art directors, we have content writers, um, we have prototyper, visual designer, 
um, and then also hybrid that, uh, folks that do kind of a little bit of everything as well. And so for our team, within Lean and UX, we're constantly working together. So this is actually a time lapse of one of our design critiques that we had. Um, this is an hour long critique and one of the things that we're doing is constantly giving feedback to each other. This is a little bit more of a formal one and this is something that we gave, um, uh, we do typically once, once a week. However, we have impromptu um, design critiques as well. So in 2013 to 2014, um, we did something really, really big for PayPal. So some of you guys might be familiar with this part of PayPal, kind of the older version. Um, but last year, we did huge things. We changed the entire consumer website, which took a lot of work. And for us to do it in a span of a year was incredible for this company. And so within the changes, we did a variety of different things. We made it responsive. So it, may, it not only worked well for a desktop experience, but it worked well on mobile and tablet experiences as well. So we were able to serve our customers and users in a more contextual way. We also considered a new content strategy within this. Um, we updated our visual style, and we also um, made within all the content that adaptable as well. So within a year, we were super, super busy. However, that didn't just happen overnight, the cultural change. Um, before we were able to do this, we actually um, worked with Jeff Gahelp, and he helped us understand how we could work better um, within a lean way. So what we were doing when I joined PayPal in 2011 was um, we were part of the waterfall design methodology, which um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have done waterfall before. Um, and it's, it's great in some organizations, but for us, we weren't able to be agile and nimble enough to respond to what was happening competitively um, in our sector. So for us, what it looked like was the requirements were handled by product owners who worked just with product owners. Design happened just within designers and we pretty much were sitting together and just collaborating on that level. Developers were also sitting somewhere completely different where we almost never got to see them and they were working and we weren't collaborating on that level. Same thing with QA and then when we finally shipped things, we were like, hope that works, you know, and we would test at the end. However, after we switched over to Lean, we were able to work on smaller teams where we had a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary um, team where we had developers working directly with designers, with content writers, and then um, hybrid designers as well that were prototyping, um, working with content writers, and we're pretty much just small little focused teams focused on getting a core product out together. And so, go back to this. and so one of the best things about this was that we were able to test more often and be able to get frequent feedback, so we were able to change our design on the fly. Um, and also our deliverables are starting to look different within Lean. So this is an example of something that um, showed a, maybe like a month of my work. So I created a prototype within Envision, um, also sketched, um, handed off things in my work in my sketchbook to developers to work on some ideas. Um, in the left corner, um, my coworker Michelle showing a paper prototype that she made to be able to gain influence and be able to quickly come up with an idea and sell it to a product owner so she could get bandwidth to work on it. And then we also stuck to traditional methods such as um, using Omnigraphle for doing um, interaction design and also being able to like flesh out a little bit more of the flows. But the best thing about Lean UX for us was that we got to talk to customers throughout the entire process. So it wasn't just at the end when we were done with our design. We were able to just say, okay, we have an idea. Let's go talk to some customers and see if it makes sense. So we were able to not necessarily invest a ton of time in something that wasn't gonna work. And so because we were talking to users more frequently and sooner, we were able to change our trajectory, trajectory as needed and able to see exactly where we should be going with influence from our customers. And so we even had a new division that we brought into our design um, section, which is the customer driven innovation facilitator. So it was people who are actually there to help designers figure out how to best um, create tests or the type of prototype or even low fidelity prototype as I showed with a paper prototype to get in front of users and be able to facilitate conversation for us. So it basically was a coach for us to be able to do user research quicker and faster. And so one of the things that we also did was we applied the reduction methodology to 
Um, so this is the flow that we had in our classic. It's kind of hard to see, but um, there's a ton of content on here. So this is a flow for when you're trying to withdraw money from your PayPal account when you have a balance, and you're trying to withdraw it to your bank. And so this is what it looked like, and it had way too much going on. And through being able to talk to customers and quickly be able to innovate, uh, we were able to actually change it to be very, very simple and actually have better conversion for us too. So analyzing how much um, content we had on the page, where was our central call to action, um, also intuitively within the interaction, be able to surface information so we didn't have to just show everything, the whole kitchen sink, once the person was able to land on there. So one of the things that was also really interesting was throughout this entire process, as, as we were changing PayPal, I was spending a lot of time in the office, but I was also spending a lot of time um, with my team. Um, with Roller Derby because we were ramping up for a big season. We had a lot of really, really important games. And as I was spending time in the office and as I was spending time in our warehouse, I started noticing a lot of different or similarities between both the teams and how we were able to collaborate. And that's something that I wanted to share with you guys today. And so the biggest similarities that I saw were how we treated our environments and how we able, were able to create more of a team-based environment. Um, the amount of available tools that we had for um, being able to collaborate and how that facilitated us working together. Um, how we we're able to, once we had the right tools and the right environment, be able to properly work with each other and to be able to continually learn. And then at the end, how we define success. So was a W always what we were going for? Was the win always the only thing that we were shooting for with roller derby? or also within design where we're only shooting to have the best product all the time that was in number one in the app store and not necessarily learning from what we were doing. Um, we need to redefine what success looked like for us. So team-based environments. So when I first joined PayPal, this is what my desk looked like. We call these like our gopher cubes. Um, I also lovingly referred to them as, as jail at one point. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, my boss actually worked in the that was like right over here and we had the glass partition. And so being able to talk to each other, we had to talk to the glass if we were both sitting at our desk, which was awful. <laughs> and then um, we had our design, um, our art director that actually sat behind this. And so if I was talking to him, I almost never see him unless I would come around to the end of the cube and be like, okay, how's it going for on? What are you working on? And so it was very much a, you work in this environment, this is your desk. And it was very hard to collaborate with everyone. Um, and even when I poked my head up, it was still really hard to see where everyone was. But um, when we made the change to Lean, um, one of the things that we did from um, an enterprise level was we made a commitment to change the environment that we worked in. So this is a time lapse of um, our works, one of our workspaces and how they completely gutted it and made it, instead of like the gopher type um, cubes, made it more open concept within um, this particular office. And so this was my desk. So suddenly I didn't have these crazy walls and I was able to see exactly who I was working with. And also we relocated so the teams that were working together for Lean could directly see each other and were just a couple either desks apart from each other or right next to each other. We joked that everyone was in Nerf dart range. Um, so everyone was able to shoot each other with the Nerf darts that we were able to um, somehow get with budget, which is awesome. Um, and so looking into our environment, we could easily see what was ever, everyone was working on. It felt like more of an environment where we all collaborated together instead of I work here, I come here nine to five, I do my thing and I leave. It came more of an environment where everyone was invested in what we could do together because everyone was so engaged in everyone else's projects and able to talk with each other so frequently and also not depend on email or anything else like that to be able to communicate since it was literally just turning, you know, and talking to the person next to you. In this instance, um, here's my project manager, Terry, uh, my boss, Laura, content writer, Paul, and then um, visual designer, Vivek. And so this, was, this is what every day looks like for us now. And it's, it's amazing, and it totally helps us be able to collaborate a lot better. And interesting enough, it, around that same time we were making a change with PayPal, we were also making a change for the Santa Cruz Derby Girls. This is our warehouse that we had for about two years. And then in 2014, we ended up um, changing into a new warehouse. Um, we loved having our own practice space. It was definitely an advantage for us, opposed to leagues that didn't have them. 
However, the only private room and collaboration space that we really had off the track was this room back there that everyone used. And so um, we weren't able to have team meetings without everyone in the warehouse being there. Um, it, was, it was just really, really hard to collaborate within there. And so last year, we were able to secure a venue that had rooms for all the teams, including the referees, the coaches, and the um, board of directors. So everyone had their space where they could collaborate and then also write their common goals. And so we also saw that beyond um, everyone just feeling like they had more invested in there and they had their own private space, the teams utilized um, the spaces to also create common goals, um, schedules, be able to do feedback. We did some design or some actual skating critique within these spaces too, which made people feel way more invested in like, this is the place where I go to build my skills. This is the place where I go to work with my team. Um, this is an example of um, some of the writing that the A team, the bombshells, um, had for last season, we had a listing of all of our games that we had and how they went for us. Um, we had some of our main mantras, um, which was, why not us? And so every single time that people went in to view um, or to go into their space to gear up, they saw these common goals and they saw these mantras and it reminded them to keep everyone kind of focused on the same um, themes and get everyone like reinforced of this is what we're working on for right now, this is what's coming up, or this is the common theme that we want to be able to um, remind ourselves of. This is um, our B team, the Hellcats. Um, they also have their games listed here and how they did. Um, they're, since they're the B team, not necessarily as competitive, they also had a slightly different theme for them. So instead of why not us, they had, their theme was who has more fun than the Hellcats and to also keep their morale up. So it was a really, really fun place for people to be able to collaborate. Um, and also within the Hellcat room, one of the things that they did to really own their space was every single time that a person was brought onto the team and made a roster, they put their handprint up on the wall. And so they felt like, I'm here, I'm able to be invested in this, this is a cool thing that I'm now a part of. Um, and so it definitely is one of those legacy things. We've actually changed our structure so we don't have this team anymore. However, it was so important to everyone in the league, we still actually have this up, which is really cool. Um, and so one of the best things with like being able to own your space and have that common open space is that everyone's able to come in and feel like this is the place where I'm able to work together with a group of people to have one common goal that we're all working towards and we're feeling invested instead of like I work and do my individual thing, it's what we can do together and what we're able to, to get out of that. And so once we had our environment set up in both PayPal and at the Santa Cruz Derby Girls, one of the things that we assessed was what tools do we need to provide or what are we missing from this environment to be able to thrive? Um, <laughs> this is one of my favorite photos from a toolkit needed um, moment was, so one of our point scorers, or jammers, um, Candy, had actually broken her skate mid-game. And so she needed to be able to do her job as a point scorer. However, she didn't have the right tools at this time um, since they didn't have a toolbox to be able to fix her skate. I think her skate plate actually broke in half with this. Um, and I think Liv's face kind of says it all, like, okay, what are we gonna do now? Um, so when I joined the league, one of the things I did was I brought on a toolkit um, for everyone to avoid these moments. So instead of, oh, you know, I'm having, having a moment with my skate and I'm not able to do my job and I need the tools to be able to do what I can, um, it's there. And so we don't even have to think about it anymore. So I really assessed, like, after my experience of coaching for years and years, what are the things that people actually need? So in this kit, we have duct tape, we have um, wheels, we have different Allen wrenches, um, we have Hello Kitty band-aids, because apparently that's what the girls needed. I don't know. Um, and then one of the other things that the girls requested a lot was Tums. <laughs> this is actually one of the most common themes that things that's used in the toolkit. Um, one of the most fun items that we have in that particular toolkit is, is laminated photos of cute animals. So when we're having like a really, really tough game and everyone's maybe not in the best mood, we actually bring out these photos and it kind of turns everyone's mood around, which is super fun. And so being able to provide those toolkits, um, at least for roller derby, helped us think, okay, we're in the right environment to train. We have the right tools now. Um, what can we do next? And then I saw a similarity at PayPal where once we had our environment set up and we were collaborating more, we were talking, we were sketching, we were whiteboarding, um, I noticed that there was still a lack of something happening. Um, we were talking more and more about, okay, I want to be able to quickly get an idea out to leadership. I want to be able to 
Um, you know, even within a lunch break, I have this great idea, I want to be able to show something and being able to influence up to get bandwidth or budget or user research time. Um, and one of the things that we noticed was paper prototypes were doing a really good job for the, for the um, designers that were able to do them. However, not everyone had access to those tools. And so what we did was we actually created a paper prototyping toolkit that we had in our design teams. And it was really, really simple. It cost less than $50. Um, we had double-sided tape in there. We had X-Acto knife. We had a self-healing cutting board, um, different type of double-stick tape, um, glue, different types of pens, and also cardstock with this, various cardstock. Um, and because we were able to provide this, we had a lot more people that were then creating um, templates and being able to have our assets where you can easily print them up and then cut them out as needed and then do a paper prototype in less than half an hour, be able to show it to leadership and somebody saying, yes, this is a really good idea or this does make sense. Um, and so providing a simple thing like that, less than $50, we were able to empower designers to do more with what they had for ideas, which was, felt really, really empowering for everyone. Um, this is an example of Michelle with actually one of her ideas she had for um, a different send money flow. She wanted to do something with gifting and had a really, really good idea and was able to do that super quickly and, and be able to get bandwidth for it. Um, and so I know that this has been like a common theme throughout this conference too, is common toolkits and things like that. I'm just gonna briefly touch on that here just because it's a huge thing within this, is within working in a large organization is having the right tools and everyone having a mutual understanding for how they're used. For a particular at PayPal, we have um, pretty much a set list for most designers, what they'll use. They'll use a combination of um, all three of these or just one. So we have um, actual, or sorry, Omnigraffle that we use for um, thoroughly designing um, flows or really, really complex things that we need to maybe send to legal or that we need to get brand to buy off on, something that goes beyond just a whiteboard sketch. Um, we'll use Omnigraffle, and so we have a, a really wonderful stencil toolkit where somebody doesn't necessarily need to invest the time in recreating our assets that's easy to upload. We have the grids that are set in there for all of our devices and everything snaps to it, so we're able to collaborate on an easy level. We have the same thing for Sketch. Um, instead of using uh, Photoshop, we're almost all of our visual designers and some of our user experience designers, like myself, are using Sketch now to be able to create um, high fidelity wireframes and also the assets that were needed to do, um, that needed to use for prototyping. And for prototyping, one of the, we, there's still, the jury's still out on exactly the tool that we're gonna officially endorse, but for the most part, for user testing, we're using Axure. And we also have um, a set toolkit with that as well, where we have a lot of the interactions that are used stencil, like in a stencil equivalent. So if you're looking for a page to load, a spinner, um, an error case, a login, where you can pretty much just grab that and nobody has to recreate them. It does take a little bit of an investment of time, but it's been completely worth it for consistency, for keeping style and interaction the same. Um, and so we just made sure that when we're creating things, we also include in our bandwidth to be able to do that. And it's been really, really helpful for us to collaborate on that lean level and to be able to collaborate quickly and with remote teams as well. And so this is the example of the one that we use for checkout for our style guide that's in Sketch, where you can pretty much just grab everything. And the wonderful thing that our visual designer did with this is she's not only an amazing visual designer, but she also writes CSS. So it has the CSS that goes with it. So when I'm sitting with my developer and I'm bringing up the style sheet, they already see exactly all the code that goes with it if it's not already something they've, they've coded into their um, current workflow. And so being able to do this has allowed us to have the right tools at the right place to be able to move quickly and be able to stay consistent. And that's the so, so important for at least a company on the level of PayPal where we're working as a financial institution and having that consistency really helps with the trust that people have in our company. And so once we have the right environment, we have the right tools, um, it was then up to us to figure out how we were gonna properly work together. Um, this is actually one of our half times um, when I was coaching the Silicon Valley um, from a really, really hard game where we played a competitor for the very first time, totally unfamiliar with them. They came out of nowhere and completely blew us out of the water and did an amazing job. And we were trying to figure out halftime, what happened? What did we do differently? Um, where are we vulnerable within this? And even just how is everyone physically feeling? In this instance, our captain had actually broken her nose in the first half, and so she wasn't particularly happy at that time. Um, and so often within when we're 
having group meetings when we're talking about feedback, it's really easy to feel deflated and to feel like the blame game happens and people just getting really worked up and not necessarily having action items to go from this. Um, and so one of the things with this too is we found the same thing happening within our retrospectives at PayPal. Um, this is actually one of the bug bashes that we had on a weekly basis with our engineers. So this is um, Derek, our front engineer, um, McCool, our back end engineer, and then our visual designer, Vivek, um, for the wallet team. And being able to just do quick feedback in this instance started out, it's really, really hard. Nobody wanted to invest time in into it. Getting people to come consistently to these meetings was really, really hard. And so we took a step back. And for myself too, since I was leading this effort, I was like, what is it that we need to do to get everyone on board with this? We need to figure out how to, we can tighten up our processes. Um, and so I ended up thinking about it in two ways. For doing impactful retrospectives, it's best to go in with intention from a leadership point of view. If you're trying to address momentum, so in this photo, this is actually the end of our 2014 season for um, our 18 the bombshells. We had just great season. Um, we had a lot of really, really amazing games, some wins, some losses, but overall, everyone was really, really happy with our performance. And so when we were thinking about what 2015 was gonna look like, we wanted to be able to have at least a post-mortem for the, for the end of the year to think about what it was that we were gonna do as a league um, and as an individual team to continue to build up that momentum. Um, and then the other thing to think about too is not only momentum, but it is your retrospective trying to address morale. There's sometimes when the best thing you can do is get everyone together to address when things are not going right and it has nothing to do necessarily with the product itself. Um, it maybe has something to do with the processes or interpersonal connections as well. And so when we're trying to address uh, momentum, one of the things that we use is the start stop stop, start, continue methodology. And so this is something that can be easily done um, per, just one-on-one, -on -one, can be done in groups, can be done um, a little bit more thorough in a fashion or just on the fly. And so this is one of the instances after a scrimmage for the bombshells where we use this methodology. So what I'd ask the girls to do was to take two sticky notes and for them to talk individually what they were gonna contribute to the team in regards to what they were gonna stop doing what they were gonna start doing, and what they were gonna to continue to do at this particular time. And so it took less than 10 minutes. And what we did was we then had everyone put the piles together so all the stops were together, starts and continues. And then we addressed them and we tried to find commonalities within that. And so what we were able to glean from that was um, some of the problem areas that we were having for the team, but also the areas where we were doing really, really well or we just needed to modify. So the areas where we were not the most efficient were the stop. Those are all the categories for the things that um, we weren't doing well. So we were letting the refs get in our head. We were being more concerned with the other team was doing or saying and not with our individual performance. Um, the start was where we were missing opportunities, where we had the chance to do what we were training, to, we had trained to do, but we just didn't step up and do it. And then the continue was also acknowledging, hey, we were doing something right out there, and those are the things that we should focus on continuing to do. And so throughout all those commonalities, um, it was easy to see trend over time. So this is a little bit more of a thorough one that we did, um, and being able to find just those opportunities to be able to do better. So stop getting distracted, stop with our hesitation, um, stop paying in a panicked mode. Um, being able to really think through with what we were trying to do and to calm down, quite frankly, too. And so being able to do this over a long period of time, so this is actually something that we did throughout the entire season, and this represents maybe like a couple months of doing this. Um, from a leadership perspective, I was able to step back and then see the trends of how we were basically performing and noticing when we were facing competition that was ranked higher than us, we played more desperate. But when we were playing teams that were ranked lower than us, we were playing in a fashion where we thought, oh, we got this, and being too overly confident. So being able to step back and look at the trends with this, and then the feedback really coming from the girls themselves was really, really impactful for the skaters, being able to step back and be like, hey, I'm responsible for this, and I can change my attitude, or I can change the way that I'm behaving or interacting in this group, or the things that I'm doing really, really well, and I should be able to influence out and have other people continue to be, you know, also trying to do these things as well. And so we started doing it at PayPal. 
Um, so as I mentioned, we had a hard time getting everyone to attend our bug bashes. And so this is one of the things that we did. Um, convince the team that, hey, I know retrospectives are kind of not what everyone's into, but if you give me 10 minutes of your time, we can easily knock this out and being able to have action items to come out of this where nobody feels like they're blamed or nobody feels like um, fingers are being pointed at them. Um, so with the stop categories, it was really, really important for us to address this in a way where people weren't feel, feeling that deflatedness. So it was about personal accountability and everyone kind of stepping up to recognize, you know, where the inefficiencies were. Um, where were there problematic team dynamics? Maybe where people needed to have a moment where they needed to squash something personally, but they weren't able to voice it at the time it was happening. Um, and also it surfaced um, root cause for like a lot of problems. So for example, somebody might have, you know, not been able to schedule um, uh, I don't know, like their babysitter was late so they came to practice for Derby really, really upset. And so being able to say that, hey, my attitude actually started at home and I needed it to stay either at home or needed to stop there. And so it had nothing to do with the team dynamics that were actually happening while we practiced. And then the start category, as I mentioned, it really helped us see the missed opportunities that we were having. Where could we have been doing better with what we already had? Um, you know, where can we improve our communication with each other? Where we know each other really well when we're playing derby and we're practicing in between, you know, six to 12 hours every single week, where do we just need to polish up our skills? Um, and then it's also rooted in personal ownership within this. So people were able to say, hey, I'm responsible for feeling this way, or I'm responsible for doing something differently about this. And then in the continue category, it, pr it helped promote the positive contributions and also acknowledgement within that. It highlighted the things that within our process that were working that we needed to continue to do. And then also acknowledged that the general team dynamics as well. And so how um, people were doing good things definitely where we were also still needing to improve in other areas. And so being able to address those was really, really important. But as I mentioned, there was also um, the morale issue that was happening too with this. And so um, we also put another caveat into start, stop, continue that um, looked a little bit different where people were talking about accomplishments and acknowledgement with, that were personal and team-based. And this is something that we did not necessarily with start, stop, and continue to begin with, but on it separate as its own. But now we've woven it into the, at least that process. And so what we asked everyone, and this is one of the things we actually did at PayPal that was really, really awesome, was with the accomplishments, what did you set up to do and that you were able to do? What did you set out to do that you were not able to accomplish? Um, and then what did you set out to maybe not do, but you did accomplish? So things that you were able to um, at least say, hey, I wasn't necessarily meaning to create a style guide, but I ended up doing it, so that was great. Um, so acknowledging the things that you are actually doing within this process that maybe you weren't intending to, but had a really positive contribution. And at least with the acknowledgement, um, this was a huge thing for addressing morale, um, at least on our team for checkout. So as I'm most, most of you guys are aware, so PayPal and eBay will be separating within this year, and so there's lots of time crunches in regards to some of the um, designs that need to be done. And so there's a lot of pressure within the teams and a lot of, um, you have to get this right now, we're you're separating, you have to do this. And so there's a lot of extra um, pressure that's going on for a lot of the teams, and in particular the designers, to get things right first. Um, and so this is one of the things within the checkout team, since we work really heavily with eBay, that we, ha we do pretty much on a regular basis. We're also able to say personally, what am I really happy for you know, accomplishing within this? But what do I want to get acknowledged for? Things that maybe I'm working really hard on, maybe on the weekends or staying late, and people are just assuming it's kind of whatever work or it's not even being recognized. So what is it the team would like to personally acknowledge within this? Um, and then also on that individual teammate level, acknowledging other people on your team is super, super important too, to say, hey, I noticed that you were doing this, this is great, um, and I want everyone to also hear and recognize you for that. And then also on a team-based level of saying, you know, together we are actually doing some really great things. And so weaving this into Start, Stop, Continue, and then also using it on its own has been super, super helpful. And then from a leadership perspective, as I said, it's really, really important to recognize into um, 
the, the retrospectives, what is the intent with this? So is it morale-based or momentum-based? And for you to also have a really good idea going into that retrospective, what it is that you want it first addressed, and then what you want everyone to feel afterwards. Is it something that our momentum is gonna continue to move through the action items that we have through that, or do we have action items to follow up with building on morale? And so redefining success was the next step within this. So we had our environments, we had our tools, and we had the way that we were gonna communicate with each other. But then we had to define what it was that we were gonna work towards and what success meant to us as a team. And so one of the <laughs> best examples of this was last year, um, Borbach Bombshells had worked really, really hard and had been moved up in a division. We were currently um, competing in D2 for the Women's Flat Track Derby Association which was the teams were ranked between 60 and 40. There's about 200 leagues in the association, so that's pretty good. However, we'd been in that um, division for a little while, but we worked really hard and we made it to division one, which was a huge accomplishment for us. You know, made our small town proud, made everyone that was part of the organization really, really stoked for us. And so we got invited to um, playoffs in Sacramento and we were super, super stoked and honored. And then we realized, crap, oh man, we have to play this really, really amazing team. We have to play the Denver Roller Dolls. This is like one of our leagues that we've looked up to for pretty much all of our involvement in Derby. This is a team that constantly wins by huge differentials. It has amazing talent and teamwork. And we were really nervous. Um, but we also looked at some other things um, that might help us feel a little bit differently about it. Um, I have to make sure to get the numbers right on this. So for... Um, Q1 in uh, 2013, Denver um, on the bottom was currently ranked number two in our entire association. They were the total badasses. <laughs> and in fact, over to Q3, they were also ranked number two. However, at that time, we were ranked number 62. And then in Q3, we were ranked number 64, which, you know, we're moving up, we're doing some good things, which is awesome. And then in Q1 um, of 2014, um, we'd moved up to um, 32 which was cool. At that point, we made it into Division One. We feel pretty legit. Um, Denver, at that point, had moved to um, number eight, and so they were actually falling in rankings. And then finally, when we were gonna see them in Q3 of 2004, we were ranked number 23, which was the highest we'd ever been ranked, um, and we were really, really proud of working really hard to get there. Um, and Denver had uh, actually dipped down back to number five. So at this point, we saw, you know, in the perspective, this is the time for us to strike when the iron is hot. We've never been in a better situation for playing them. We are ranked the highest we've ever been ranked, and we should really take this as an opportunity. Um, there's this site called Flat Track Stats that takes um, all the games that two teams have ever played and has an algorithm and then says, predicting wise, if these two teams face at that particular time, who would win? And so this was right before we played Denver with um, how well we were gonna do. We had a 1% chance of winning. Yes, yes. Um, and our point differential was gonna be uh, maybe not so awesome. And so we were like, okay, we could look at it as like, all right, this is gonna be really awesome. But ultimately, this is exactly how we felt. We were like, oh God. Um, really, really nervous about the whole thing. Um, and so we, we played Denver, and we actually came up with uh, a set of goals for what we wanted to be able to do with this particular game. We knew that 1% was a really, really long shot, but we also knew that a win for us might look really, really different than what it might say on the scoreboard. And so, yeah, we did lose, <laughs> you know, 260 to, to 48. Um, but one of the wonderful things was we also had this perspective of, all right, so we played them, they totally beat us, but we didn't die. Nobody got injured, everyone was able to play on the next game. We actually had three other games after this that were for rankings as well, that were against competition that was ranked either really close to us or way higher than us. So we had to stay in a really, really positive attitude. We had a big weekend ahead of us and we had many more opportunities to do better. And so we had to get ourselves in the right mindset for this. And so one of the lucky, awesome things about roller derby is we have a bunch of really amazing photographers that um, post pictures really quickly after the games. And so this is one of the pictures that's actually posted the night after, or the, um, maybe like a couple hours after that game. And it's hard to see, but Denver's in blue. And um, our point score in the white helmet is, is right there. 
Um, and for us, we took this as success after looking at this picture because one of the things that we had decided was when we were going to play Denver, one of the things we wanted to count as a measure of success was how graceful we could be under pressure. And this is as graceful as it gets. She's smiling and they're totally kicking her ass. <laughs> so um, that was really one of the things we were like, okay, we can totally face the rest of this competition. Nobody's ranked higher than them. Um, and then we looked at the stats. So the stats were posted really, really soon after this too. And so for us, once we saw that we kept them scoreless 34% of the game, that was amazing. Nobody anticipated that we were going to be able to do that. And for us to use that as a measure for when we were able to face other parts of the competition um, that weekend, it was success for us. And we did really, really well. We actually had a bunch of podcasts and um, interviews where people were giving us really high praise, even though we totally got our butts kicked. Um, and then also we looked through the photos a little bit further with a fine tooth comb and looked at the successful moments we'd had. So our point scorer, Jammer, um, Ace, actually in white there, is totally plowing through their captain at this point. She was, had trained, cross-trained for months for this particular game. And because she had been doing that, too, I mean, she was doing like two insanity workouts after each other. <laughs> it was insane. Um, so she was able to be super powerful and to get, you know, get her job done. And that was really amazing. Um, and then we also looked at how you know, our competition also faced against them when they played Denver. And so the number 19 ranked team, um, Terminal City, so the team that in the photo I showed earlier with SVRG were in the post-mortem and everyone's really, really upset, they had actually just played um, Denver and they were ranked number 19 and we did just as well as they, you know? And at that time we were ranked number 23. So we were saying we were making incremental success at that point and so we were really, really proud of that. And so also at the same time, this is the end of the game after we totally uh, had a really awesome time. Everyone's smiling. Everyone's really happy that they had this experience. So even though it didn't turn out with that W, everyone definitely took a lot from it as that learning experience and was able to move on for the rest of the weekend. We won two of our games and then we had another really close game that we didn't win, but we learned a lot from it. So we had a really successful weekend because of the mindset that we put ourselves in. And so this directly like, goes into design um, and how we're able to view success. Um, for us at PayPal, this is one of the whiteboard sessions that we have. We were trying to tackle a problem that we had received from um, our user research team where they were saying, we're noticing a lot of people are still having confusion about what PayPal balance is and where people like, where you can use it, what that means even in regards to your funding instruments, um, and being able to successfully like interact with the, you know, with the with our design. And so I came up with this idea of, all right, I'm going to be able to create this prototype and be able to um, do some user testing. And I had this idea that instead of saying PayPal balance, we were going to say PayPal total, and it was going to be a sum of your available and some of your pending, and people were going to totally understand it, and this was going to totally solve the problem. So we did user testing, and this flopped. Users were like, this makes it way more confusing. I don't understand anything that's going on with my particular balance at that time. Does total mean? my credit cards and my, my credit that's available and all these different things. And so even though I had, thought I had the solution that was going to like fix everything, it actually didn't necessarily do that. And so using the methodology that I had used in my Derby team and stepping back and being like, okay, what did I learn from this? Where am I able to apply um, you know, this information and how can I do better? I was able to think, okay, move on with this. And we actually have some stuff that's um, being tested right now that I'm really, really excited about. Um, that hopefully you guys will get to see soon um, that will hopefully tackle this. And I kept on going back to the quote in my head that I gave the team right after we played Denver and we were trying to get ready for our next game, which is this Franklin D. Roosevelt quote, which is a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor, which is when things are going really, really awesome all the time, it doesn't necessarily make you a more skilled person or give you those opportunities to learn and grow. And so that's the biggest takeaway probably from all this is continue to learn, continue to grow, and continue to view things as learning experiences and look at incremental success within this as well. And so, wrap up, how can you bring Derby to your team um, without necessarily hip checks and skates? And so, view your team environments as our space, our collaborative space, instead of the space I go to to work. Um, also, provide the right tools at the right time. Assess for your team what it what it is that you need, whether that's a really thorough style sheet and sketch or an actor, or also be able to provide the right tools of, um, you know, a toolbox even um, for that with, with, for paper prototyping. Um, view your uh, retrospectives for momentum or morale-based and have intent behind what you want to get out of your retrospectives. 
And then also redefine success for your team and be able to look at those incremental changes and also the learning experiences within this. And so, thank you.